Okay, we'll start this thing over. Bob Lust the Pond Boss checking in. We had a bad internet connection. Looks like we've had some weather here in the last few days, and so uh, I think our internet slowed. So I'm going to start this thing over. Greetings, everybody. Bob Lust the Pond Boss checking in from the balmy hills of North Texas. Tim Stewart, I see you check back in. I appreciate that. Hope you guys will in here and let's get this thing rolling again we had a slow internet connection looks like and it just wasn't working too good so we're gonna start over so i see leanne checking in danny mack shane mcintyre good to see shane alex short good to see you man so uh i don't know if i'm gonna be able to see this online or not so we'll just have to roll here you were getting ready to say whether you canceled the bob lusk institute fire yeah okay well <laughs> I do want to talk a little bit about this stuff. Um, our next Institute of Higher Pondology has been scheduled for almost a year for April 2, 3, and 4. And today I decided to cancel it. Not cancel it, but postpone it. So I called everybody and either talked to them or left them a voicemail and then I said, followed up with an email. And my thinking is, is that with the coronavirus scare that's going on and what's happening right now in our society, I just think it's prudent for all of us to take care of ourselves. You know, I think it's prudent for you to take care of yourself. And I'm going to talk a little bit about all these different things, and I'm going to do the best I can to answer your question. I'm going to have to operate off my phone because our uh, internet looks like it's moving slower. It's so let's see here what Tim said here. Got it. Okay, when it went down. Hello again. Been planting 400. Danny Max planting bare root plants. That's sweet. Good. That's nice. Brian Lawrence. Hey, Kyle McKean. Hope you're hanging out up here in this part of the country. Mike DeMint, John Funk. I saw your email, John. I just didn't get a chance to answer it today, which I'll uh, check in with you. Drew Hayes checking in. Chuck Brinkman, I guess, is the, this is the only social gathering that's safe for a while. Jay Spires. Good to see you, Jay. Dick Tabert. Yes, sir. Mark Primo is checking in. Chris Chavetta. Hi, Chris. <clears throat> Hold on. Uh, the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology has been scheduled, but I've had some new intel. I see Harrison Davis. Good to see you. The largemouth bass are already on their bed just outside Atlanta. Well, I'm glad somebody's living a normal life because I don't think the rest of us are. <laughs> so uh, what I decided to do with the Institute of Higher Pondology, we had three guys flying in. One guy coming fr from Idaho, from Spokane, Washington. Another guy flying in from uh, Northwest Illinois from the Quad Cities, somewhere outside of Peoria. And then we had another gentleman, Al Allison, who has been a Pond Boss subscriber and has made every Pond Boss conference. He's in his 70s, really, really active learner and a, an outstanding Pond manager. He was coming from Charlotte, North Carolina. I see Mike DeMint, Mike was scheduled to come. He's from Memphis. You know, we got Ron Ardoin, from uh, South Louisiana, he was bringing three people, but what I decided to do, and I, and I talked to several of these guys today, I thought it was smart to postpone it. So I see Kevin Briggs, Justin Schick, really patchy internet, Bob, trying ethernet cable from the router. If I was close to the router, I would do that. But what I did was I turned off the internet and now I'm going straight off of AT&T, my cell phone. All right, let's see here. Kevin Briggs. Howdy, Kevin. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. Click like. Share this to your uh, Facebook feed. And you'll be eligible for a drawing for Palm Boss. Any Palm Boss mug. I saw Bob Bush here a while ago. I'm going to give Bob a call here in a couple of days and just kind of check his pulse. He works with Purina Mills. And, uh, he's, he, uh, he really knows a lot about feeding fish. He knows a lot about feeding wildlife. And feeding chickens. The guy's a bird expert of all things. Matt Hines is watching. Good to see Matt. So um, what I did was, is, is, is I, had, I had a couple of things happen. As you can imagine, I've got a few clients that are physicians and attorneys and that sort of thing. I mean, you can't be in this business for 40 plus years and not have some clients like that, which I do. And so... Uh, Let's see here. Okay, now the internet's back up so I can start seeing your questions on my computer. Okay, good. 
I see, I see, I see. Good, 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 good. good. Frank James just loved the new magazine, just got it. Yeah, we were a little we were a little bit late because we wanted to get the resource guide finished and mail it in conjunction with the magazine. The uh, uh, I'm gonna look back through these comments right quick. Shane McIntyre, good afternoon. Okay, Danny Mac. Yep. Okay. All right. I'm back caught up now. So uh, my daughter-in-law, who's married to my son, they live in Houston. They have a piece of property out west of Houston near Brenham. Texas, just renovated a pond and put some fish in it. Well, she's a pediatrician. And we had a conversation Sunday. Uh, she had a conference call with her bosses who have been in the medical business for a long, long time. They're both physicians as well. And they said two really profound things that hit me. Number one was they're going to change their protocols, how they operate in their clinic. Of course, with a pediatrician, you know, they look at a lot of babies. So they've changed the way that they're going to process their patients. And they're actually going to start with a triage to find out symptoms outside and then bring the people in to take care of them inside the clinic. But the most profound thing that she hit me with that struck me was, let's see here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I stopped right in the middle of that sentence, didn't I? The most profound thing that struck me was she said, with the coronavirus, we think that this pandemic is larger than what is perceived. And what she said was that we believe that there are more people that have been exposed to that virus than anybody knows. And when we get the ability to test more people, that will be proven. So with under the under the suspicion that there's a lot of people out there that have been exposed to this virus, but it hasn't been detected yet, that's all the more reason for us not to gather in, in, in groups and places. So I decided to follow the recommendations of the president. Groups bigger than 10 don't do it. So I decided to postpone it. Now, I'm going to follow through on this just a little bit, and then we're going to talk some pond business. So, uh, the part of my thought process is this. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm knocking on the 65. I'll be 65 March 28th. I was going to have a birthday party. We canceled that. Had over 100 people invited. Canceled that. Had a family reunion a couple days after that. Canceled that. We had like 60 people invited to that. So we, we postponed both. And we postponed the Institute of Higher Pondology. So once this national crisis we get on the back side of it and it settles down, then we'll look at rescheduling some of these things, including this Institute of Higher Pondology. So I think it's smart, and actually, I've got a son that lives in Phoenix, Arizona, Ty. He bought four airplane tickets for his, his lady and kids, and they were gonna come. I called him today and said, see if you can get your money back or get a credit for future flights. Got a son that lives in Alabama. He was gonna drive over from the Birmingham area. I called him and said, don't come. You guys hunker down, take care of these babies. Now, I, I, as a fisheries biologist, and just really drill into that more as a biologist, I'm looking at things in a different eye set than I would if I was doing something, if I did something else for a living. So, here's my thinking. Uh, it, I remember in 2005, Fred Bingman's on board. I see Fred. I see... Uh, Linda Jennings, except it's Miss David Jennings checking in. David, we got you on the calendar to come work on your leg. Well, here's, and, and David David and Fred can both relate to this, I promise. I'm going to tell a little backstory, then I'm going to circle back to ponds, I promise. The uh, uh, Back in 2005, our house burned down. Debbie called me. It was like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It was November the 8th, 2005. It was election day. I was going to go make a deposit at the bank. I'd been doing some things on my computer, and then I was going to uh, go vote and then go home. And Debbie calls me at 2 o'clock. Honey, Lusk, you got to get home. The house is on fire. What? I'm serious. The house is on fire. I said, have you called 911? She said, yes, I have. I dropped what I was doing, drove 13 miles in about 10 minutes, got to my house. She was across the pond holding our little grandson, Nolan, who was an infant. 
Had our little dog, the Yorkie named Romeo. Got some funny stories about Romeo to share around the campfire with you someday. And uh, I went around to the house. And I went in and I could hear the fire crackling 35 feet up in the ceiling of our great room. We called it back then at LL comma one. Lust Glotch comma one. And I thought, you know what? They're going to get this fire put out. And we're going to sleep here tonight. And three or four minutes later, the fire department comes. They start running the hose. And they don't have any idea what to do. The fire is, 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 is in the installation between a metal roof and a metal ceiling. They couldn't get to it. So the fire was burning laterally, then hit the walls and started burning down. Our house burned to the ground. And so what my thought process should have been, instead of thinking, you know, they're going to get this put out. We're going to be sleeping here tonight. It might smell smoky. That was my thought. And so I got my camera and started taking pictures where I probably had 15 minutes that I could have gotten some really important personal effects out of the house. But I thought, no, they're going to get it put out. Well, the house burned out. So the lesson I learned from that years ago, you know, hell, 15 years ago now, was expect the house to burn down and think like that. So I'm thinking about that with this pandemic. So my thought process is expect the house to burn down, but if it doesn't, we can sleep here tonight. So as I've thought about this, the most profound thing that my daughter-in-law said was, we don't know how many people really have the virus in them, even though they don't exhibit any symptoms, even though they don't know that they've been exposed. It's kind of like when you're managing your pond, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so I talked to three different clients of mine yesterday and today that are physicians. Every one of them had the same comments. We're taking this deadly serious. We don't know how many people are out there actually carrying the virus and they just don't know it. And they caught it in a restaurant or they caught it on an airplane. So I made the decision today to cancel the Institute of Higher Pond, not cancel it, but postpone it. So we're going to put it off. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, uh, here's, here's, here's my take. Three weeks ago, a month ago, every one of us were sick and tired of hearing about impeachment hearings. We were sick and tired of hearing about how divided our country is. We were sick and tired of anger and hatred. Nod your head if you're with me. Every one of us were sick of that. We're not hearing that now. We're hearing about a pandemic of an exponential reproduction of a virus within the entire nation that could impact as much as 70% of the population. And of that number, 10% of those people are vulnerable to it that could actually die from it. So now our governments, state and local governments, as well as the federal government, are making decisions that are hitting every single one of they're hitting us in the back pocket. They're hitting us emotionally. You know, they're hitting us with the way that we act. I mean, uh, go to the grocery store. You know, y'all you nod your head. The toilet paper counters are empty. The shelves don't have any bread. There's nothing in the meat boxes. So people are, are going living through fear, I think. So now what I'm going to tell you is this. Here's the upside. This will pass. Let's see here. Okay, I'm seeing some things here. Let me go back here and look a minute. Frank James, his daughter is in isolation now. She may have the coronavirus. What's going on right now? I see Bill Monica. Good to see you, Bill. Holy cow. Let's see here. Danny Mac. Okay. I'm going to go back and copy. I'm going to go back and read your comments here in just a minute. But here's what I want to tell you. And I believe this with every ounce of who I am. I believe that the crisis that we're in now is going to cause every person around here, especially adults, to look within. You know, we've been having a pretty dead gum good life overall. The economy's been bustling. You know, now it's down, the stock market's down 45%. The common man has lost a lot of money that's been invested in that. There is fear, and it's not over because we don't know what we don't know. So there's a fear of the unknown. But what I'm going to tell you, we're not thinking about hatred. We're not thinking about anger. We're thinking about taking care of ourselves and taking care of our families. 
And I think that that's exactly what we should be doing. We've got two grandchildren at our house, 11 year old and a 12, a 15 year old who are hanging out with us. Their mother is a nurse at the biggest hospital in Dallas and their father works at another hospital in Sherman, Texas. You know, there's no reason, and the school is canceled. Well, we can bring them in, we've got food. I got ponds full of fish, do you? Raise your hand, I know you do. You know, Mike DeMint can go the whole line in the Mississippi River and catch a fish if he needs to eat, plus the pond that he's got with his stuff. Frank James is the same. You know, every one of us here, we, we've got resources, and we're gonna have to rely on those resources. And we're gonna believe, and our faith is gonna be tested. You know, and I tell you what, I have peace, and I want to convey that to everybody out there. I I have peace that we're going to go through a test. Now, you know, we all say, gosh, we haven't been through this before. Well, if you've lived very long, you have, because you went through the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was like six years old when I was having to be taught to go sit in the safest corner of the classroom, put my head between my knees and kiss my ass goodbye in case a missile hit us. You know, then the Vietnam War. You know, then we had um, hostages in Iran. Then we had 911. You know, we had HIV AIDS hit in the 80s. So there's always some adversity that's hitting us, hitting us individual. And I believe that this adversity is going to cause most people to look within, derive their strength from their source. My strength is from God. And that we can convey that strength and come out on this on the other side and be stronger and see what really matters. I mean, I sat, I, I probably spent four hours with my grandkids today hanging out in my house when I should have been working. No, I should have been grandkids. So now it's 6.52 and I've been kind of on a little, little, little soapbox here, but I, here's what I want to tell you. Be calm. Be assured that you, here's the deal, you can do what you want to do to help other people. That may be helping yourself, that may be helping your family, it may be helping your neighbor, it may be helping a stranger that you don't even know because that lady is a waitress who, one of my daughter's concerns is that she has she has over 500 employees underneath her. One of her concerns is, is that with schools closing, she's gonna lose a bunch of nurses' aides that get paid like 13 or $14 an hour because they don't have a place to leave their kids. So they're not gonna be able to work. If they can't work, how are they gonna pay their rent? If they can't work, how are they gonna buy food? So there's gonna be a lot of people out there that are gonna hit, be hit pretty hard with this if it lasts more than a couple of weeks. So I have faith that as a nation, and as individuals that we're gonna, in this pond management community especially, we're gonna reach out and help other people. I see that coming. And I'm really excited about that because when we come out on the back side of it, we're gonna look back at, it, back at it and say, holy cow, that hit fast. It hit hard. We took it, counterpunched, and now we're on the back side of it and we've grown from it. That's what I believe is gonna happen. You know, is it over? No. Is it gonna get worse? What does that mean? You know, are people going to die? Yes. You know, but I know this, we're going to come out on the back side. So you know what? I'm going to tackle a few, I'm going to tackle a few pond management questions here. Let's see here. Um, let me look here. Kyle McKean, can I stock sunfish? Now, yes, you can. And I've got some. So let me know and we'll gather some up for you here pretty quick because I've got some. Okay, so I'm hoping that now that I got off the internet that we're in a whole lot better shape. Let's see here. Looking down here and seeing all the comments. Danny Mac wore his lake consultant shirt. Holy cow, I've got one on right here. There it is. There's, there's the Bob Lush shirt. Mark Brown, pond close to full near Dayton, Ohio. Glad for pond wash to focus on something besides the virus. And, and then I ran in for 20 minutes about the virus. Let's see, Frank James talking to Mark. Heck, that's cool. Let's see here. Danny Mac met with Van Schultze to buy some minnows. Of course, I was wearing your hat. That started a nice conversation. You know what? I'd love, haven't seen Van Schultze. Van Schultze has got Tank Hollow Fisheries down in Poteet, Texas, the strawberry capital of Texas. 
And he is just a rock solid great guy. Here's Chris Blood, Texas Hunter Feeders. Let me do a, let me say this. Wade, I mean, uh, I see, I see Wade Bales. Hey man, I'll just check in with you here. Um, Chris Blood, Texas Hunter. We love Texas Hunter Feeders. They're best on the market, best customer service, best products. Chris Blood represents Texas Hunter, and we're really glad to call him a friend and really glad to call him a sponsor of this show. And David Jennings said, this will pass. If you want something permanent, try faith, hope, and love. That's exactly right. You know what? You know what, David? I think this whole circumstance that we're dealing with right now is to draw us away from everything that we don't like that have been distractions to our lives and bring, our, bring us together as families to dig down into and recognize faith, hope, and love. That's where we're going. And I hope that every one of you can see that. So don't live in fear. Live in faith, hope, and love. I, I, I know one of, the, one of my favorite stories was when uh, uh, the Peter, uh, Jesus had a revival, told the guy, say, yeah, I got some things to do. Y'all take the boat going across. I'll catch up with you in a little bit. And so Jesus the wind got up, Jesus walked across the water, got close to the boat, and the disciples looked up and said, holy cow, there's a ghost. Jesus says, no, dude, it's just me. And so Peter says, how do we know it's you? And he says, come, come to me. So Peter got out and he walked across the water. Then he looked down and saw the waves, felt the wind, took his focus off of Jesus, and saw him. Jesus had to pick him up, put his butt in the boat. You know, I think if we will keep our focus on our faith and our hope and our love, stay within, on the backside, there's going to be some fantastic stories come out of this crisis. So I'm pretty excited about it. Mark Dauber. Hey, Mark. There's my wife, Debbie Dobbs, checking in. Debbie Dobbs loves. Tim Stewart says, I'll be thinking, I think a lot of people will be thinking more about sustainability. Let me tell you something. Small catfish ponds and keeping some bees might be part of that. I totally agree with that. You know, Debbie and I have talked about this for years. At, at LL, comma two, because after our house burned, we were able to rebuild our home. And I hope that a bunch of you get to come share that experience because we built our place to share. And after this Corona thing is gone, we're going to go back to real Coronas with real limes in the real Coronas. And you guys come to the house. Yeah, yeah, he said, I can't believe it. Yes, he did. But uh, where I'm going is, is that we have been thinking about sustainability all along. We've got chickens that lay eggs. We've got a pond full of catfish. A pond, and the same pond's got a bunch of bluegill. We've got several ponds where we've raised fish to eat. So if we were, if we, if it comes down to it, and we've got to supply some food for the neighborhood, we have two months worth of protein just because we've thought ahead about sustainability. We've got enough chickens because the damn predators keep eating our chickens through negligence on my part. But we got eggs and we've got meat and we got feral hogs within here. So if we need to shoot a pig, we can. So sustainability is something that's pretty dead gum good. Let me look down there and see what's going on here so I can catch up. Matt Singley, I stocked my two acre pond a week ago. I put a thousand copper nose brim in, one to three inches, 300 red ear brim, one to three inches, 2,000. Toughy minnows, that's fat heads. The 300 catfish fingerlings, four to six inches long and 10 grass carp. The catfish are starting to feed good and I'm seeing minnows come to the feed. But I haven't seen any brim yet. How long does it take for the brim to start eating? I'm feeding Purina game fish chow that's 32% protein with multiple sized pellets. Man, the first couple of bags of that game fish chow and then go ahead and switch over to Purina Aqua Max MVP. It's a higher protein feed. The game fish chow is good as a supplemental food for catfish, and it's good to uh, to maintain bluegills, but if you really want to make those fish grow, you're going to pay more money for it, but they're going to convert it much, much more efficiently, and your fish are going to grow faster. Uh, to answer your question, it's a, just a function of time and repetition. The, the, the more consistent with feeding your fish, the more consistent they'll become with eating your feed. So same time every day that you can and then when you do that then you're going to see consistency with your fish i see clark cole clark is a man of faith good to see clark checking in 
Danny Mac, what do I do with a $600 chicken coop, feed, lights for warmth, and four baby chicks? <laughs> you wait six months and you get eggs. I'd go out and get about four or five more baby chicks because they won't all live. All right, John Wilson. Hello, John. Tommy Davis checking in. I was thinking about you the other day, Tommy. I was wondering with all this stuff going on, if people are coming to the feed store, I kind of got a feeling that, that people are going to be coming to the feed store for sustainability, to buy garden plants, to buy chicks, to buy chickens, to buy feed, to, to keep on rocking and rolling. Daniel Joseph Thompson, good outlook on the situation in life, Bob. This is a great community, and we can do good for others. That's exactly right. I totally, totally agree with what you're saying there, Daniel. On the subject of harvest, we often discuss releasing fish that are within the removal slot limit, but that exhibit exceptional characteristics, girth, broad shoulders, etc. I could be wrong, but I hear less about the scenario with a bigger fish outside the slot limit than is underperforming. For example, a low RW or a skinny fish. Here's the question. Let's say you tag a fish in 2017 that's two pounds and catch that fish in 2020 and it's only gained six ounces. Should the pond manager remove these types of underperforming fish once in a while for effective population control balance? or just stick to removing the slot fish in hopes of the bigger underperforming fish begin to do better? I sure I understand the answer depends, but just look, no, I tell you that answer doesn't depend. Take the fish out. You know, a, a fish that's been that size for two years, or let's see, you, it's, um, you stocked it in 27, so you're three years and it's only gained six, six ounces, out it comes. So, you know, part of the reason for having a slot limit is because we know that by the third year, when your fish begin to overpopulate with their young of the year. So we're targeting primarily those young of the year in year three, four, and five, and we're gonna be taking out those that are underweight, underperforming, and preserve, preserve the best of the best so they can make it to the JV on up to, on up to the varsity. But when you come across fish that are underperforming, as for example, you catch you, let, let's say your slot are 10 to 14 inches and you catch an 18 inch bass and you look at your shark, it should weigh three and a quarter pounds and it weighs 210, boom, out it goes. It's underperforming unless, unless it's just post-spawn. If it's post-spawn, change. But if that fish is in the, I'll tell you, here, here's, here's your guideline. Uh, Wade Bales is on here. Wade has got the Smart Fish app. If you haven't subscribed to the Smart Fish app, do that. Go, go to Smart Fish app, Google it, you'll find it. You can register, it's free. And what it is, that on your iPhone, you can plug in the length and weight of the fish that you catch right there on your iPhone, and it's gonna give it a score. If that score is 85, or actually, I'm gonna tell you this, if it's under 90, except just the month after spawn, if it's under 90, that fish comes out regardless of the size. Now, I'm gonna tell you a little story. I got a bunch of those. The, uh, uh, we, we electrofished a lake a few years ago. and the, We saw like five size classes of bluegill. The different sizes of bass were pretty good. The, the lake was starting to show signs of crowding of bass in the 11 to 13 inch size class like that. And then we shocked up one bass that was probably, if I remember right, 22 inches and weighed a little over four pounds. And the landowner held that fish up and he looked at it and he held another one up and looked at it. And this one was at about 75% of what it should be. This one was at about 95% of what it should be. He said, do we have a food problem? So what we did is we aged those two fish real quick and this one figured out this fish was 13 years old. So it was on the back end of its lifespan. That looks like somebody 95 years old. This fish was six years old. So it's got some life in front of it. So he said, what should I do? I said, you should take this fish out. It's declining, it's gonna die. It's done. This one has got some good, vibrant, healthy years in front of it, and your food chain is in good shape. So he looks at these two fish, back and this one studied it he looked at me kind of puzzled and he threw it back in the lake and then I looked kind of puzzled <laughs> so I said uh, alright tell me what you're thinking he says well Bob that fish grew up in this pond it can die in this pond I'm not kicking anybody's grandma to the curb 
So I couldn't argue that point with him at all. But I'm going to tell you, if you're catching some bass that are, that are under 90% starting in like May until even now, don't count during the spawn or right after the spawn. But if they're under 90 percentile, they should come out because they're not performing. So if you got a bass that had it's gained two ounces in two and a half years, out it comes. Yep, Tommy Davis, my wife is doing. Yep, you know what? I get that. Steve Lewis, good to see you, man. Scott McClurg up there in Nebraska says, "What temperature is a good time to start bluegill on MVP?" You know, right now, uh, when your temperature is 46 degrees. It probably needs to get a little bit closer up to, you know, 50, and the bluegill will start feeding. Now, they're going to be sluggish. The bluegill will start really ramping up their feeding, coming to the feeder when the water temperature is knocking on the door of 60, 55 to 60. Now, they're not going to be aggressive, but they're going to start ramping it up, and they will, they will start coming up and eating fish food. Tommy Davis says, we're selling a lot of plants. Hard to keep them in. You know what? I bet, man. And I bet you you're going to be selling a whole lot more plants. We, uh, I probably, I bought some seeds from Seed Savers and sprouted a bunch of heirloom seeds. I mean, I love to go to a Purina store and go through the, you know, buy baby chicks and go through the plants and buy plants. But I also like to sprout some. So back in January, I sprouted some heirloom tomatoes and things. And they're just really kind of, coming into being. Jacob West is checking in. Tommy Davis, severe, severe weather had something to do with it though. Was told by the Monty plant driver that they had some plant houses with some bad damage not long ago. I think they're based in Alabama, aren't they, Tommy? And uh, the plants aren't coming as quickly. So they so so there's gonna be a little hiccup in the in the supply line. Jason Nepstad, stocked 800 wipers, size of my finger and 1500 fingerling F1s. Any idea how many will typically survive to grow to a 